horrors of Thanksgiving and America as a white future minority. Coming up. Far and away, the most massive genocide in the history of the world. The lowest life expectancy in the West. And the year the U.S. will turn native. Virtually none of Thanksgiving has an ounce of accuracy. Notes the bestseller Lies My Teacher Told Me. The idea of Europe bringing civilization to the Americas simply flips truth on its head. This is what European explorers actually found in North America. Far and away the most beautiful city on Earth. Five times the size of London or Rome. Great towers and buildings rising from the water. 60,000 gleaming houses and how spacious and how well built they were of beautiful stonework and cedar wood and the wood of other sweet scented trees. The many streets and boulevards of the city were so neat and well swept despite the multitude of inhabitants. Crisscrossed with a complex network of canals like an enormous Venice but also remarkable floating gardens that reminded of nowhere else on earth. While Europe was drinking water from its polluted city rivers, huge aqueducts transported America's water from fresh springs. But what impressed most were the special merchant areas where timber and tiles and other building materials were bought and sold, as well as greengrocer streets where one could buy every sort of vegetable, fruits, honeys, nut paste and chocolates. Astonished by the personal cleanliness and hygiene of the colorfully dressed populace and by their extravagant use of soaps, deodorants and breath sweeteners. Most Europeans never bathed and kept clothes on at all times. The Pilgrim's Notes biographer Zini Finer had a terrible smell. Indians tried, quote, without success to teach them to bathe. The settlers also had bad breasts from rotting teeth. Death and starvation were so common that corpses were just dumped in open pits known as poor holes. Many turned to alcohol and committed suicide. In fact, the story of the first settlers has been deliberately changed, notes author James Lowen, because the truth is so shameful. They actually settled hundreds of miles further south and stayed in America because the mission was a failure. Their real aim, reports historian Robert Beverly, was to find some gold and take it back to Europe. They spent their days digging random holes in the ground, haplessly looking for gold instead of planting crops. Soon they were starving and digging up putrid Indian corpses to eat. They took some Indian prisoners and forced them to teach the colonists how to farm. And the meal with the natives wasn't quite the Thanksgiving shown on TV and in school books. The colonists offered the Indians a toast to eternal friendship, whereupon the chief, his family, advisors, and 200 followers dropped dead of poison. In mainstream history books, perhaps the most common description of American territory then is virgin land. In fact, notes historian Peter Jennings, it was widowed. Horrific enough, the Nazi ethnic cleansings in Europe during World War II. Leading American studies professor David Stannard notes it's dwarfed by, quote, far and away the most massive act of genocide in the history of the world. The death of 100 million indigenous people in the, quote, American Holocaust. Some from disease, but also vast numbers from a deliberate policy aimed at wiping out the race that mainstream history books continue to pretend never happened. He knows when Heinrich Himmler called the final solution, quote, de-lousing, Himmler was only echoing the pilgrim army's rallying cry, Nits make lice, Nits being Indian babies. This was a map of Indian nations across the US. 80% of the first government's entire budget went on attacking existing Indian settlements to take their developed farmland. The settlers would most probably not have survived, writes Jennings, on their own. 95% of America's entire population was then wiped out. American Holocaust notes there is documented evidence of colonist leaders going town after town, deliberately killing all men, women and children. Yet school texts and history books remain silent. Orders came from the very top. Under the direct order of George Washington, at least 28 of 30 Seneca towns and all the towns of the Mohawk, Onondaga and Cayuga were simply obliterated. George Washington wrote the Indian country, quote, must be destroyed. Thomas Jefferson called to, quote, pursue Indians to extermination. Nobel Peace Prize winner Theodore Roosevelt called beneficial the eradication of the native race. Standard notes, genocide was official public policy. California Governor Peter Burnett in his 1851 message to the legislature. Extermination must continue to be waged until the Indian becomes extinct. 
Another governor issued the public proclamation to, quote, pursue, kill and destroy all Indians. A witness notes the ensuing bloodbaths practically wiped out the native race. The whites shoot them down like wolves, men, women and children, wherever they could find them. This war of extermination against the Aborigines is tending to the final extinction of the race. What reportedly saved the race from extinction was their use as slave labor. This extermination policy has proved so injurious to the interests of the whites. Indian labor is indispensable. Highly prized slaves were Indian girls as young as three, said the Marysville appeal for fulfilling double roles of labor and of lust. Phil Lane Jr., hereditary chief of the Hanks on One First Nation. Phil, really great to see you. What facts are being airbrushed out of history? Practices were that, uh, that sometimes you don't want to speak about, and they not only wiped out most of the people, but the way they did it, the greatest loss of people at any time in history. Cultural genocide is still being waged on surviving Indians, reports Truthout. From the start of the 20th century, children were forced into so-called Indian boarding schools designed to, quote, kill the Indian in them, according to the system's founding father, Richard Pratt. Indians are obliged to change their name to a Western one like Tom, made to dress and style their hair like whites. Indigenous Americans are also forced to adopt Christianity and all other parts of Western culture. The North Stiff Arm witnessed the abuse firsthand. Thank you so much for speaking to us. Can you tell us what happened? Federal policy here was to, uh, was to take the Indian out of the person. They beat the language out of, out of like my father. He grew up his whole life. His hands were kind of, uh, kind of bent. As a result, he used to talk our native language, but he never wanted me to learn. I consider myself a recovering Catholic because of, you know, the sexual abuse that I experienced, you know, from the Catholic Church. Daniel Sheehan says the genocide is continuing. He's helped start the Lakota Child Rescue Project to stop the forcible removal of Indian children. Daniel, thanks a lot for coming on. Could you tell us what is happening to the children? And what we discovered is that not only were the children being taken on an epidemic uh, level, that it was happening on every single one of the reservations and uh, in virtually every one of the major cities. The International Convention Against Genocide actually has a provision which expressly identifies what's going on as genocide, that the, the systematic undertaking on the part of the racially dominant culture in a given nation state taking away indigenous children from their, from their native tribes and putting them in the white culture has been identified as genocide. Even the Supreme Court still upholds native second-class status to this day, writes noted legal scholar Robert Williams. He joins us now. It's really great to speak to you. Can you give us some examples? One out of three Indian women will be raped during their lifetime. In 86% of those cases, uh, the victims report that it's a non-Indian that perpetuated the sexual assault or the rape. This has been traced directly to the inability of tribes to prosecute these crimes. One of the points I make in my book, Savage Anxieties, is that if you look at the history of the more civilized nations treatments, so-called more civilized nations treatments of indigenous peoples, it really makes you wonder who are the savages uh, and who are the more civilized. One very famous study done found that every single treaty that the United States had negotiated with tribes had in fact uh, been breached at one time or another or had been violated. The uh, Supreme Court said they had no property rights and therefore no rights to just compensation. Uh, and there was some horrible language in the opinion about uh, how the court recognized that everyone knows that the savage tribes of America were conquered and the treaties were really meaningless anyway. So it's this perpetuation of these stereotypes in this, in this case, which is still valid law in the United States, it's still a valid precedent. And so they, and so they drink it, but it's actually hairspray. Native Indians now have the highest rate of suicide and pandemics of cancer in the Western Hemisphere. At 44, life expectancy is lower than Afghanistan and around the same as Europe at the time of the pilgrims. For an official banquet to celebrate 350 years since pilgrims landed, authorities invited native Indian Frank James to speak. But when they saw his speech taken from a settler's own account of what really happened, they wouldn't let him read it. The pilgrims had hardly explored the shores four days before they robbed the graves of my ancestors and stole their corn, wheat, and beans. 
The Indians knew this fact, yet welcomed and befriended the settlers, little knowing that they would be killed by the settlers' guns. What has happened cannot be changed, but today we work toward a better America, a more Indian America, where people and nature are once again important. Frank has helped start a national day of mourning each Thanksgiving, a protest over the Plymouth Harbor and Mayflower replica. On the West Coast, thousands also gather for un-Thanksgiving Day, calling on the U.S. to honor treaties promising Indian rights and international law. The American government faces increasing domestic and international pressure. The Supreme Court has reaffirmed the validity of the Treaty of Fort Laramie, giving Indians rights over the area. The United Nations, despite four countries voting against, Australia, New Zealand, Canada and the United States, passed a resolution declaring indigenous people's right to self-rule. The UN is also calling for the states to return to Indian tribes their stolen land. The Mexica movement wants to bring indigenous people of America in a single nation without, it says, the artificial borders created by Europeans. Movement's director, Olintes Gatlipoca, joins us. Really great to see you. You say the demographics are on your side. We are projected to be the majority in the states of California and Arizona and basically the Western United States. In the next 50 years, we're going to be the majority in the United States of America. For the European uh, who's scared about all this, uh, I'd say pull a seat over because that's what we've been doing for 500 years. We've been scared of of uh, all of the monstrosities that Europeans have done to us. They've exterminated 95% of our population. They've stolen 100% of our land. They've left us in poverty on our own land. Many cities throughout the US are already majority indigenous. In eight years, eight more states are projected to be white minority. In 30 years, that will apply to the United States as a whole. The reaction of certain Americans is already causing some surprise. Seek truth from facts, this is the truth seeker.